You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. A corpse that wouldn't stay dead. A pistol with a silencer on it and a fortune in a black satchel. Spelled death for the big city boys when they finally got together in lonesome Arizona. Population, 802. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Lonesome Reunion. At 8,000 feet on a clear afternoon, you can see enough Arizona real estate to become an authority on the subject. And as I huddled around a circle of window aboard an American Airlines flagship and gaped like a two-weeks-with-pay vacationer at the carpet of sand, stone, and cactus unrolling a slow inch at a time below, I was impressed. Also, I was thinking about a job which was providing both the switch and scenery and two crisp $100 bills, less the cost of a round-trip ticket from L.A. to the capital city of Phoenix. But then, at the thought of money, I stopped sightseeing and started to think about the work ahead and how easy it had sounded that morning in my office. When Kay Gordon, who was something pretty and blonde, but slightly tarnished for 28, had hired me, all in one breath. Marlowe, my brother Joe Gordon is in a room at the Granada Court Hotel in Phoenix, Arizona. In one hand, he no doubt has his usual smelly cigar. In the other, a small suitcase filled with a mess of papers, all legal, all proper. You fly there, pick up the suitcase, fly back for that $200 cash. Yes or no? Yes, on one condition. The papers, do I get to see them? If I look, I go. All right, you look. Good, I go. Goodbye. That was the way it had started an hour after breakfast. Lunch was alone and at the airport. Then it would wait until I'd seen Mr. Joe Gordon, a man who was willing to pay a lot for a little. My plane dropped out of the sky over Phoenix gently at 3. At 3.15, I was in room 111 of the Granada Hotel and only 36 smelly inches away from the usual cigar. The man behind it was heavy, pale, and maybe 40. And like his sister, Joe Gordon was overbearing in a hurry. This, Marlowe, is the bag. These, the papers. Stocks, bonds, and mortgages. In themselves, worthless to anyone else. They're non-negotiable. But as information to my competitors, they're priceless. Satisfied? More or less. Meaning what? Exactly what is your line, Mr. Gordon? Oh, I'm a broker. One who bets on long shots. When they come in, I don't like to split with the boys who sit on their hands. Mm. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, I've got some time to kill before I fly back. Do I take the bag now or later? You take the bag now, Mark. Okay. And uh, don't let go of it until you're with my sister in L.A. I'm paying you money to stay away from my enemies, not the shop for trinkets. Oh. Oh, and uh, incidentally, my enemies also play rough. So watch your step and act smart. Real smart. <laughs> I still had two hours to kill when Gordon locked the bag and handed it to me after dropping the key in his pocket. So I decided to take a room there at the Granada Hotel, shave, shower, and stretch. The sleepy clerk in the lobby was not in a hurry, nor did he hear anything I said the first time. So when I finally got to my suite on the second floor, which had as much elbow room as the inside of a lifesaver, 30 of the idle minutes were already gone. I locked and bolted the door, checked all the windows carefully, and then peeled off my shirt broke out my shave master and reached for the knob on the bathroom door. But I never made it. Because as the door swung open, I caught a glimpse of a fist the size of a cantaloupe starting from my jaw. Oh! Now hey, stay oh, right there, Buster. The first time I swing, the second time I shoot. And I do both good. Equal nice, huh? Everything all figured out ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, but it ain't very hard, Marlo. Especially when the guy you're after shouts it all to a desk clerk. My error. Yeah. Which leaves just the three of us, real cozy like. Three? You, me, and 120 grand here in this bag. You're way off base, brother. This bag's got papers in it, nothing more. They belong to a businessman. <laughs> I said something? Yes, you're very funny. Look, Buster, Joe Gordon's no more a businessman, and his real name is Joe Gordon. So after I leave, you go back to Sam Dietrich in room 111 and tell him that Marty Stopka says thanks. For what? 
for the $120,000 I've been waiting two long years for. And also tell him and G.G. Ganther, who might still be around, that Stopka had it all figured, like you say, Marlowe, ahead of time. I don't follow you, bud. You're not supposed to. Just turn around, face the wall, and listen carefully. You tell Sam Dietrich that I knew he'd pull something like this just as soon as he got back into circulation. You got that? Yeah, yeah. Word for word, stop you. Good. Now all you have to do is remember. When Marty Stopka said remember, he put that cantaloupe with fingers in the small of my back and shoved hard. By the time I got to my feet again, both he and the black bag were gone. That made Joe Gordon or Sam Dietrich my best bet. So I took the stairs to the ground floor fast and raced for the end of the corridor in room 111. But when I threw the unlocked door open, I found something I hadn't counted on. A curtain flapping in the breeze of an open window and nothing more. The desk drawers, the closet, the bureau empty. And on an end table next to the telephone, a bus schedule unmarked. At that, I was beginning to get very mad at a private detective with public patsy named Philip Marlowe. Then the telephone rang, and when I answered it, the operator said that she had a long-distance call for Joe Gordon. I said, thanks, I'd take it. Hello? Sam, this is Kay. I... Marlowe? Yeah, honey, Joe Marlowe is in Brother Gordon, remember? Oh, I can explain all that, Marlowe. Oh, sure, sure, baby, but not now, later. Later, after you've had a chance to think up a few more lies. All right, all right. So I didn't tell you the whole story. What's the difference? Did you get the bag? I did, but I didn't get to keep it very long. Something ugly named Stopka wanted either it or my life, so I made a quick decision. Stopka has the bag. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, isn't it, though? Huh? One thing, baby. I'm the decoy with suitcase for some kind of shenanigan that's wrapped around 120 grand, which you and Sam Dietrich have. And there's a trio in the act. Namely, Sam Dietrich, Marty Stopka, and one G.G. Ganther. G.G.? Marlowe, have you seen G.G.? Uh, have you, Marlowe? Maybe yes, maybe no. Now, why don't you come clean? Admit you're happy that Stopka got the suitcase from me while Sam beat it out of an open window. That my part of the job is over with. Come on, baby, talk. All right. I'll make it short and to the point. You got $200 for doing nothing. Out of that, 60-odd went for an airplane ticket. The rest is yours, right? Go on. There's no need to, Marlowe. I'm finished, and so are you. So why don't you just be a good fella and keep the change? So long, sucker. When Kay Gordon hung up, I slammed the phone down, counted ten twice, and went back to the unhappy business of getting mad at Marlowe. But again, I was interrupted. This time, it was a newspaper, the Phoenix Herald, sticking far enough out of the wastebasket under the telephone to expose the dateline, which made it exactly a week old. I picked it up and saw the two inches of story circled in pencil and slug, five released from state penitentiary. Uh, Sam Dietrich, 41 of Los Angeles, who was arrested in Lonesome, Arizona for the armed robbery of a general store in February 1947, also was released today. Now everything was beginning to add, with one high-priced exception. Very few general stores in towns called Lonesome keep 120,000 bucks in the till, even on a busy day. So I headed for the office of the Phoenix Herald and the chance that I could learn something about the cash involved from newspapers that were two years better than one week old. Thirty minutes later, I was in the back shop of the Herald receiving facts willingly supplied by a sandy-haired linotype operator with a sad face who had never heard the word forget. That's right, mister. It was the Second National Bank of Land Company here in town. Uh, held up at 1.10 p.m. February 7, 1947 by three men who took $120,000 in unmarked cans, 20s, and 50s. One was badly wounded and running gunfight, but they all got away clean. No arrests, no suspects? Well, other than the usual rigmarole of trying to pin the job on every two-bit stick-up man hauled in the next six months, no. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, thanks. I don't think... Say, wait a minute. Lonesome, Arizona, that unmarked bus schedule. Tell me, do you happen to know where something called Lonesome is, and if so, how a guy could get there if he doesn't have a car? Sure. It's 87 miles west of here, and the bus will do the trick. But not anymore today. Oh. Uh, the only bus left an hour ago. And uh, now, young fella, you tell me something. What in Sam Hill is lonesome and a bus departure got to do with a bank robbery was pulled two years ago? Where I stand right now, Dad, I can't say. But when I get the lonesome, ask me again. I may have the answer for you. I was 30 minutes renting a car and an hour and 30 minutes getting to lonesome. Population 802. I drove without seeing anything that could possibly be mistaken for Sam Dietrich. And I was about to turn back when 
I saw something that brought my right foot down hard on the brake. It was a brand new green Nash standing outside a motel. California license plate. I got out of my car and got a look at the registration card wrapped around the steering wheel. It said Catherine E. Gordon. The motel only had three cabins that showed any light. The first belonged to the manager and the second to Kay. Close to an open window, I saw the man Kay was talking to. He was an ex-convict and part-time broker named Sam Dietrich. All right, all right. So Marlon knows he was set up for Marty Stavka. Who cares? We're here and so far Stavka isn't. And if and when he does show, we'll be gone with the real black bag safe in our hands. Yes, but what about Gigi, Sam? I told you Marlowe mentioned his name. And I told you to forget it. Marlowe must have been swinging in the dark. Gigi can't be alive, Kay. He was badly hurt when Stopk and I got clear of the bank. But why wasn't his body found? I don't know, Kay. I've told you that a thousand times. <sighs> now, now, look, honey. Why don't you just relax and think of us a little, huh? <laughs> Gigi's dead, baby. There's only you and me. Sam, you know how I feel about that. I love Gigi. But the only reason I'm helping you, I don't want anything to do with this money. I only want to know for sure about Gigi. Okay, okay. Hey, did you get a line on Leland Mills, the name that was on that mailbox two years ago? Uh, yes, yes. He owns the place and lives there alone. Uh -huh. A once upon a time small ranch on the last block in town, coming apart at the seams. Mm -hmm. What about Mills himself? He's an old duffer, maybe 50. Lives close to the fireside, day in and day out. <laughs> Good. That means I can handle him without any trouble. And now, look, baby, it's uh, seven now. At nine, this town will be fast asleep, and at ten, I'll take care of everything. So uh, why don't you just curl up there on the couch and think about nice things? Huh? Oh, nice things like what? Well, like the money I hid at Leland Mills' place five hours after the boys and I took that bank. <laughs> the $120,000 that's soon going to be back here with me where it belongs. Dad, I took my cue and left because one Leland Mills was a man to be forewarned while 10 o'clock was still three hours away. I was ten minutes finding his place, which was on the edge of town, and another two locating the doorbell, which was the kind you pull to start a bunch of jingling inside. It was three pulls later before the door creaked slowly open, and what had to be Leland Mills stood in front of me. He was shaggy, gray hair curling on the sides of his neck, a face with a thousand crisscross wrinkles and dirty old clothes. Everything I'd expected, with one exception. Gripped firmly in both hands and pointed directly at my head was a long, long rifle. Who are you? Uh, Mr. Mills? Maybe. Well, I'm a private detective named Philip Marlowe, also someone who knows that there's $120,000 in cash hidden here on your grounds. $120,000? To the penny, yes. Two years ago, Mr. Mills of Phoenix Bank was robbed by three toughs named Dietrich Stopka and Gigi Ganther. Gigi? Hm, that's a queer name. It's not important, old man, but this is. Now, somehow or other, that stolen money was hidden here, in or around your place. Hmm. And tonight, one of those men is due back to collect. That, of course, means trouble for you. You think we should call the law? No, no, not yet. If we play it smart, we can get the dough spotted first and at least one of the three. All right. Mr. Marlowe, if you're sure of what you're saying, I only hope you are. Oh, I'm sorry about this gun here. I don't like poachers on my land. Yeah, we all have our pet peeves. Now, Mr. Mills, I want you to sit tight till I get back. And no matter what happens, don't open that door for anyone. Have you got that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Where are you going? To town. Check on the only two things that can possibly give us any unexpected trouble. One, a nasty man named Marty Stopka, and the other, a guy I've never even seen. The elusive Mr. G.G. G. Ganther. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first... That elusive phantom voice will be back on CBS's great show, Sing It Again, tonight. And the prize for identifying him has now climbed to a value of $24,500. Yes, for music, suspense, and sensational prizes, don't miss the Sing It Again show tonight over most of these same CBS stations. And now, with Gerald Moore starred, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Lonesome Reunion. Leland Mills standing in the doorway and worried my way back to town. If Stopka and Gigi Gantha had no more trouble getting lonesome than I did, a reunion about as quiet as a truckload of hot dynamite was due to take place any minute. 
I passed the motel where Kay and Dietrich had holed up and saw that her car had been moved into the stall between cabins and draped with a blanket to hide its California place. So they were thinking along the same line that I was. At the hub of town, I parked and started to case the lively spots on Main Street, which took me all of ten minutes at a slow walk. But a short side of the mouth conversation with a couple of resident sports revealed that the local underground stemmed from the Red Dog Cafe, a warped wood two-story wiki up on the one side street in town. It was operated by a hard-bitten blonde, 160 pounds of western motif, complete with Stetson, red flannel shirt, hickok belt, blue jeans, and the name, Flora. She sat at a table at the back of the bar room, lending a cynical ear to nobody else but my old pal, Stopka. I walked up behind him, and when he turned around, I hung one on him. A good one! Hey! Sloppy, you jackass! What do you think you're doing? Sorry, Flora, nothing personal. Now, that's enough! Now, stop it, you hear me? No rough hustle in my joint. Come on, handsome, I mean you. Me? Why, Flora, how can you say that? I just came in to ask my old pal here some questions, that's all. Here we go, pal. Come on, sit up in that chair. Uh, okay, okay, let me alone. See, Flora? It's the only way Stopka here knows how to start a conversation. Bring him another beer, will you? His old one got spilled. Sure, bright boy. When he see that you do tourists leave your beefs outside next time. Now, look, Stopka. I want to know what happened two years ago on that highway out here. You guys split up, didn't you? You better talk, Stopka. All right, we split up. The heat was on bad, and Gigi was half dead already from a cop slug in his back. Dietrich had all the dough, right? What do you think? I left him and Gigi off outside of town. I took the car to try to suck the cops away from him. We were supposed to meet later. But you kept going to save your own hide, didn't you? Certainly. It's going to pay off, sucker. You'll see. Uh-huh. Since the money was never found, you figured Dietrich hid it around here and he's coming back to dig it up. Is that it? Keep guessing, Shamus. Maybe we ought to loosen your jaw again. Stop that. That's all. You too. Now turn loose of him, handsome, and by Sadie, I'll plug you. Well, a real genuine 44. What museum just swiped that from, Flora? Never mind. Got a legal right to defend the peace and quiet of my joint, and after 22 years in this dodge, I know how to do it. Now, I asked you nice once, now I'm telling you. You, yeah. get out. That back door there. Hey, sure, I'll go, sister. Thanks for nothing. Hey, wait a minute, Flora. Don't let that lug get away. Shut up. Now, you sit down right there and count up to 50. Then you leave by the front, quietly. Okay, you win. One, two, three... Flora, look out, he's back. What? Sorry, what? Eddie. Oh, you buzzard bait. I'll leave this cannon on the back steps. So long, Flora. I beat it out the back door and into an alleyway between the shacks. Stopka was still in sight but walking fast, and when I took after him, he saw me and started to run. There was a hard, flat sound like someone striking wet sand with a hammer. <laughs> Stopka faltered and lurched up on his toes as if he'd suddenly changed his mind about running. At the same instant, on a wall, even with him, I saw the shadow of a man holding a pistol with a long, awkward barrel. The hard, flat sound came again. Stopka curled up on himself and fell. Then the shadow slid off the wall and disappeared. I ran for the wounded man, but by the time I got to him, there was no trace of the gunman. I rolled Stopka over. He was hit hard, slipping away fast. Silence. Gigi always used a silence, Punk Gigi. He's dead, huh? You wise guys never know when to quit, do you? You're in real trouble now, handsome. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't do this. How come I couldn't hear the shots, a silencer? Yeah, that's right. Trademark of a guy named Gigi Ganther. All I saw of him was a shadow on that wall there. Say, what kind of law have you got in this town, Flora? None. Except the highway patrol. They stop in every night. Okay, call them. Get them over here. This guy's Marty Stopka, wanted for a bank job, nearly two years old. No kidding. Who are you, his trainer? I'm a private detective who's got no business here, except I don't like to be pushed around. Now listen, do you know Leland Mills' place at the edge of town? Sure. Well, you get the cops out to Mills' place by 10.30, do you understand? That's where the big attraction's going to be, if I can keep Gigi in a silence from interfering again. Now let me down, beautiful. I won't let you down, handsome. For a city boy, you're all right. <laughs> I stuck to a back road and drove with my lights out until I was a good, safe distance beyond Leland Mills Ranch. Then I hid the car in a dry gully and walked back. The house was dark and still, and I thought once of what might have happened to Mills if Gigi had gotten there ahead of me. I kept in the shadows and worked my way across the yard to the back door. Well, 
Who's there? Marlow. Open up. I was beginning to worry. It's pretty near 10 o'clock. Yeah, I know, I know. Seen anybody so far? No. Nope, not a soul. Been watching close, too. Did you find them men, that G.G., that Stopka? Yeah, Stopka's dead and his killer's you to show up here any time now. Oh. We're going to have our hands full of... I... Wait a minute, is that a car? Sure sounds like one. Yep. There, you can just make it out. Turned in down by the covert and stopped. Yeah. I think a man got out. Yeah, yeah, there he goes, across the field there behind your shed. It's Dietrich. I'm going out now, Mills. You stay here. No, I'm going too. That, that fellow's heading right for my water tank. All right, he's heading for your water tank. Don't get excited. You'll tip our mitt. Oh. I get this, Mills. You've got to stay here and watch for Gigi. He's bound to show up, and when he does, you better have that rifle of yours handy because he's a killer. Do you understand? Yep. Sure, I understand. Don't worry, Marlow. I'll keep my eyes open. Don't you worry about a thing. out of the door and started across the yard, I, I knew I was getting myself out on a nice, long limb. Leland Mills was about as reliable as William Tell with their hiccups, and the apple was on my head. It was too late to back up, so I skirted the barn, stayed below the crest of a low rise, and moved toward the elevated water tank until I heard a shovel biting dirt. I got a comfortable grip on my gun and headed up over the rise to where I could see. Yeah, it was Dietrich, all right. He was bent over under the tank and working on a hole as if his life depended on it. He didn't even look up until I was almost on top of him. Who is it? Who's there? Who is it? Me, Mr. Gordon. Marlow. Marlow? How did you get here? Wasn't easy, Sammy boy. But I had to come and apologize for losing your precious bag full of waste paper. You sure picked a dangerous time to show, sucker. You were fired once. Too bad you can't take a hint. Uh-huh. And being tagged as a patsy is lousy for my business, Dietrich. You should have thought of that. So just leave your hands on that shovel handle, Sam, and keep on digging. Maybe I'll let you take a peek at that 120 grand before I turn you both over to the police. Go on, dig! No! no not so fast, Marlow. Mills, I told you to stay in the... Hey. hey. That's quite a pistol. Don't move. Neither one of you. i kill you if you move. You, Marlow, drop your gun. Drop it. <laughs> well, this is where it's been all the time. A hundred and twenty thousand dollars. I've looked everywhere. Every day for two whole years, but I I never thought of looking here under the water tank. You mean you knew where the money was all the time? You lie, you lie. I'm the only one that knew that. Oh, no. One night, two years ago, I heard a noise in my barn. It was a man groaning. I looked in and I saw him. He was wounded. And I saw you when you come back from burying the money. I overheard the whole thing. You wouldn't tell them where you'd hidden it. You said you'd never tell anybody. But I was sure I could find it. And I looked everywhere except... Yeah, Mills, everywhere except here, under the water tank, where you buried Gigi's body after you killed him. And with his own gun at that. Oh, no, I didn't kill him. Dietrich here did. I only buried him so nobody would find out that him and Dietrich had stopped at my place. I almost went crazy looking for that money, but now I know where it is, and I'm going to have it. Well, you fool, you don't think I'd come out here with nothing but a shovel, do you? A friend of mine is right behind you with a gun in her hand. So come on, drop yours, Rube. <laughs> come on, come on, drop it. All right. Kay. That's an old trick, Dietrich. <laughs> Let him have it. Shoot, Kay, shoot! <laughs> Didn't work, did it? I knew I'd have to kill you sometime anyway if you ever came back, so... You <laughs> fool, Mills. I suppose that makes me next. Yep, Mr. Marlowe. I think it does. Think again, Mr. Mills. What? Who's that? Kay! You, you were there all the time, and Dietrich wasn't bluffing. Oh, I love you, Kay, baby, and I'll take the gun now, Mills. Oh. Turn it loose. Oh, Come on, I'll break your arm. Ah. There. That's better. I'll look after this gun until the police get here. And uh, look after this one, too, Marlowe. I haven't got the courage to use it anyway. I couldn't even shoot Sam Dietrich with it. He's the one I wanted to use it on. Why? Because of Gigi? Yeah, because he killed Gigi and lied to me. I promised to help Dietrich only because I figured all three of them would show up here, Sam Stopka and... and Gigi. That way I hoped I'd find him again. You were right, baby. All three of them did show up. Only this time they finished their job. For good. It was 10.30 on the nose when we got back to the house And the highway patrol had just pulled up 
So the question and answer period started, and by the time it was over, all the field work finished up, four hours plus had gone by. It took some fast conversation, a lot of promises to stay handy, but finally, Kay was left with me. After all, her only real mistake had been falling in love with the wrong kind of a guy. When the last patrol car drove away, the desert was suddenly very still. The stars were small and sharp in the clear sky. The air was cold. Maybe that was why Kay Gordon trembled. Marlo, I... I'm sorry about all this. I got you into it, remember? Mm-hmm. You also got me out of it, Kay. Well, I can forget about Gigi. Now that I know for sure what happened. <laughs> and all because of a jerk named Leland Mills. No, Mills was a desperate guy, Kay. After he buried Gigi, he just about went nuts trying to find the money. When he finally realized Dietrich was the only one who could lead him to it, he shot Stopkin and would have killed anybody else. Keep him from interfering with Dietrich until he uncovered the hiding place. You know, in a way, Marlowe, it was a horrible trick of fate. They both picked the same place to bury things. Not really. Mills and Dietrich had the same jobs to do, under the same conditions. They each had to bury something in a hurry and in the dark. So both of them picked a spot where the ground was soft and one that was clearly marked at the same time, under the water tank. Yeah, and it... Marlo, I'm kind of scared. I don't like this place, this spooky little town. It's the end of nowhere. Yeah. I wouldn't be caught dead here myself. Let's go, baby. I walked Kay to her car, started her safely on her way. So long, sucker. She waved once, then drove down the road and out of sight without looking back. Soon even the sound of the motor was gone. A ah, long night and a strange reunion. And now two lonely lights were the only sign of life in lonesome Arizona. I stood on the empty highway for a few minutes and listened to the immense quiet of the desert. Then I went back to my rented car and headed for Phoenix and a plane for home. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joan Banks, Edgar Barrier, Virginia Gregg, Jeff Chandler, Bill Boucher, and Jack Crucian. The special music is by Richard Oran. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was a weird racket that mushroomed in a world of gaudy canvas. And the man with purple hair, the inquisitive midget, and the lady with strong hands each played a part. But all that was only a sideshow when death got into the act. Across the nation, communities and the parents of Boy Scouts are observing Boy Scout Week, agreeing with the boys themselves that adventure, that's scouting. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. When my telephone rang, it jerked me out of one nightmare and right into the middle of another, where a woman with a secret, a worried man, and a shadow out of the past met with fear and fury in the dead of night. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And 
now with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Friend from Detroit. There was a wood nymph dressed in nothing but a veil of dewdrops. She was pirouetting from one huge bluebell to another on gossamer wings. And with every turn, she smiled and came closer. But just as I reached out for a hand, something happened. The bluebells changed into old tomato cans and started to ring. A bandy-legged little man with a jackhammer went to work on my head. I fell over a cliff, and just before I landed on a red-hot pile of broken scotch bottles... Oh, I woke up. But the jackhammer didn't stop. I switched on the light and looked at my watch. It was one in the a.m., and the phone on my bed table was screaming for an answer. Hello? Marlo, this is Dave. Betty's gone. She's in trouble. You gotta help me, Marlo. You gotta come over to my apartment right away. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is this? Dave, Dave Pryor. I run the coffee joint on the corner. You know me. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Dave. I remember. What's the matter? My wife, Betty, she's gone. You gotta help me. Dave, it's one o'clock in the morning. I'm in bed. Besides, you know I don't monkey with family quarrels. It's not like that, Phil. Believe me, I'm scared for her. Phil, please, come over to the apartment. 2,000 Beachwood right away. It's okay, a matter of life Okay, and... I'll be there in 10 minutes. Marlo. Marlo, I thought you'd never get here. Look, somebody fired a shot through the door, and when I got back with the aspirin, Betty was gone, All and right, I grabbed it. Dave, the... hold it. I'm not even awake yet. Look, sit down. Take it from the top. Slow. Yeah, okay. Maybe it started this morning at the coffee joint when a fancy guy came in and talked to Betty. She waits on the table. Yeah, yeah, know. yeah, I know. What do you mean, fancy? Well, a slick dress, a cufflink, stick pin, all that. I didn't know him, and Betty tossed him off to me as a masher. Maybe he was, but she seemed upset. Slower, by him. huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, tonight about nine, another guy came in, a chunky bird with a deep voice. Betty had just got back from shopping, and I was in the kitchen. See, when I heard a tray of dishes fall, and Betty came back white as a sheet. She was scared, Phil. Scared, scared. Hey! Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. All right. Phil. Go Look, ahead. I looked out, and, and that chunky guy was leaving. Betty insisted he had nothing to do with it, that she was just nervous. Was somebody else in the place at the time? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, some Tribune reporter that comes in every night was up at the counter. He was the only one. And Betty stayed on the job till you closed, huh? Yeah, till midnight. But, Phil, she was in a bad shape. Mm-hmm. After we got home here, she sent me out with some aspirin. I was only out for 15 minutes, Phil. When I came back, she was gone. And look, look, this bullet hole in the glass door to the backyard. Somebody out there shot at her and maybe hit her All or right, something. All right, Dave, steady. Now take it easy. You and Betty have a gun? No. Why? Well, in the first place, the bullet went out through this glass. It didn't come in. And another thing, Dave, who who did you call tonight after you phoned me? Why, nobody. Phone directly on the dresser. Here's open to the bees. Boone to wardrobe. Mean anything to you? No. I didn't even realize it was over there. I looked you up in the classified. Mm-hmm. Okay, come on. Let's take a look in the backyard. Any light out there? Yeah, I rigged one up for the barbecue. Look, Marlo, there must take be it something easy. you... Now, we'll straighten this out, believe me. Now, let's see. The line of sight seems to run somewhere between the barbecue and the gate. No footprints, though, maybe. Marlo! Hmm? Marlo, here by the tree, it's a hat. Gray snap brim, initials V... VR on the sweatband. VR? Mean anything to you? Oh, I know. Well, sure! That's Van Remini's hat. He's the newspaper guy I told you about. Tribune reporter that was in your place tonight? Yeah. Why should he be dodging bullets in your backyard? I don't know. Dave, where's Betty from? Detroit. When she came out here, I gave her a job. And then you both fell for each other and got married, huh? Yeah, two years ago next month. And we've been happy, Phil. We've been... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, look, Dave. Why did you call me instead of the cops? I... Well, I guess I'm afraid she's mixed up in, well, in something bad. You know, if it turns out that way, I'll have to call him myself. Okay, Phil. But you're on my side until you know for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, now you stay here, close to your phone. Okay. I'll check with you. Right now, i got to get a line on a bareheaded reporter. He can get us started if he hasn't lost anything more than his hat when I find him. So long, Dave. A reporter's hat, two strangers, and a bullet hole somehow added up to the fast fate of a hard-working kid named Betty, whose husband's only claim to fame was selling the best cup of coffee in town. It made no sense, but as I walked up the street toward my car, I figured that... Through Van Remini, I could get to the first answer. I was wrong. The first answer got to me. A thick hedge suddenly sprouted arms. One jerked me around while the other held the cold throat of a forty-five against my throat. Your car registration tag says your name is Philip Marlowe. No kidding. 
How do you suppose that happened? But it doesn't mention your racket. Shamus, maybe? Could be. And you? I'm a tourist. Oh, sure, sure. Just out to see the site. That's huh? it. One in particular. $25,000 that belongs to me. I don't want any interference from you with that square inside there. You mean Dave Pryor? I mean Dave Pryor. I'll go back in there and tell him to cool off. The little woman is all right. She's just helping an old friend, you might say. Might I say you're the friend? Never mind. Unless Mr. Jitters in there kicks up a fuss, everything will be fine. Betty knows what she's doing. She's got a lot of talent for it. Too much to waste slinging hash. And remember what I said, Marlowe. Lay off. I'll remember more than that about you, Foghorn. Just remember to count ten before you move, boy. Well, there's no point in trying to outsmart a forty-five. And with three steps, Foghorn vanished in the night. Also gone was a big chunk of my respect for a doll named Betty Pryor and her taste in old friends. Just so I wasn't jumping to conclusions, I went to my car and drove down to Hollywood Boulevard. At the first all-night gas station, I stopped and put in a call to the Tribune. Where a guy on the desk told me, through a mouthful of mangled cigar, that unless Remini was at Bungalow 24, Beverly Crest Hotel, covering the murder of an ex-Detroit hood, he was fired. Then he hung up. But the one word Detroit made the call a jackpot. So I headed for the hotel on the double. It was pink and Spanish and squatted in a grove of well-behaved palm trees at the edge of a domesticated jungle, which gave the illusion of privacy to a string of bungalows that weren't. But number 24 had all the privacy of a glass-faced cutaway beehive when I pulled up in the middle of two squad cars and an ambulance and went inside. Sprawled on the floor in front of a desk was a very well-dressed Exhibit A. Complete with cufflinks and stick pin and presiding as usual was Detective Lieutenant Ibarra, who didn't see me until I walked up beside him. What are you doing here, Marlowe? I can smell blood clear across town. What's the story, Ibarra? The name is Speck Willard, a gambler from Detroit. Retired out here to California a few years back to play horses and women. He was shot to death at about 8 o'clock tonight by a person or a persons unknown. Another gang jam? No, I don't think so. It looks more like armed robbery that get out of hand. How so? We found a currency wrapper from a local bank that read $25,000 in an open drawer in the bedroom. And one of the bellhops saw a woman, unidentified so far, run out of here about the time the coroner says that Willard was shot. A woman? Yeah. That fits because he was known to be quite a nightclubber and general playboy. You wouldn't happen to know something about this woman, would you, Marlowe? Me? Certainly not. <laughs> no, I'm after a man. A live one, I hope. Mm-hmm. Well, look, Marlowe, take this nickel. Hmm? In case you should just happen to hear something, I want you to spend that on a phone call to the police department. <laughs> now, who is it you're looking for? A Tribune reporter named Van Remini, you know him? Unfortunately, that's him over there, the sticky-fingered one by the window, swiping that book of matches just now, the one without a hat. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Thanks, Lieutenant, I'll see you. Hey, uh, Remini, can I talk to you a minute? Yeah, uh, sure, what's on your mind? I'm Philip Marlowe, private detective. Well, don't apologize. What's up, Marlowe? No girl named Betty Pryor. Pryor? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, she and her husband run a one-arm joint on Franklin, don't they? That's right, Remini. I understand Betty got into a little trouble tonight. Heard about it? Nope. Wouldn't worry, though. Trouble's not new to Betty. Yeah, that's one popular school of thought. Incidentally, you seem to be going a long ways out of your way on this run-of-the-mill murder story, Remini. You're taking a long way around to the point, pal. Get with it. I'm in a hurry. Okay, pal. But keep it under your hat. Won't you? The gray one, I mean. Oh, so that's how Yeah, it that's is. the way it is, yeah. Now, do you mind telling me what you saw in Pryor's backyard tonight? You name it. Shall I play dumb or lie? Suit yourself. See, my press card's just as good as your license, sweetheart. It gets me in, gets me out again. In my dodge, that's called reporting. Remini, I'll squeeze the truth out of you eventually. I'm sorry, I can't wait. I've got a deadline. Anything else? Yeah, one thing, a match. Yeah, sure, Marlowe, any time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Remini. Yeah? Don't hang on too long, huh? Blabla sends your pinkies. The reporter blew out the match and looked at me steadily for a moment. And his lips shaped a word I ignored. And then he walked away. I had seen enough of the book of matches he'd stolen to know it was in the Starkist room, a glossy, glass roof, dine, dance, and drink emporium near Arthur Murray's studio on Wiltshire Boulevard. So I made like I was in for the night and watched Remini leave. All the way to his car, he kept looking back over his shoulder as if he expected to be followed. I waited till he was out of sight, and then I headed for Wilshire in the Starkist room. But when I got there, it was closed. 
Remini's car wasn't in the neighborhood, and the only thing that kept the trip from being a total loss was a spotlighted picture. Ten feet square of a sultry, svelte chanteuse labeled Carla Borden. Whose come on in smile and almost costume was a cinch to increase the accident rate of the block by 20%. But then I took another look at her name and got back to business. It started with a B, as in phone book, opened to Boone and Bordeaux. I found a directory, got it open to Boone and Bordeaux, and halfway down the page was Borden, Carla, 2840 North Lucerne. It took ten minutes to get there and two more to find out that she had an apartment, number 17, at the end of the first floor hall. The door was open and I started for it, but ducked back close to the elevator when a woman came out and ran down the corridor toward me. It was Betty Pryor. Hold it, Betty! Whoa! What? Marlowe, what are you... Never mind the stall, Betty. I've been in a long time. Why, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, look, about. you left a pretty worried guy at home. Dave, did he send you after me? That's right. Why oh, can't you fools leave me alone? Why does he have to be so stupid? Hey, you've got a few ideas mixed up, kid. Oh, sure, I'm wrong. I'm the one who's all mixed up. <laughs> Let go of Not me, Not until you... I've got a couple of things straight. Now, what happened? Did life in a hamburger stand get a little stale? Yes, you two-bit snoop. Okay. Dave thinks you're in trouble, I think you're in trouble, and I think somebody waved a few bills at you and you lost your grip. Why? And you're in so deep now you can't get out and it's no more than you deserve. Now, come Uh, on, we're going right back down the hall to Carla's apartment. We're going to have a little chat, just the three of us. No, no, I won't let go. Come on. Take your hands off, Marlo. Stand still. Well, like two chums, the foghorn and its 45 caliber equalizer. Easy does it. You were lucky the first time. Little Betty, did you get it? No, something went wrong. Something terrible. Shut up. Marlo isn't deep. We'll talk after he's out of the way. All right, you. Get in that elevator, chum. And we'll wait right here to see you leave. Get on here. Yeah. That 45 makes you awful brave, chum. <laughs> this way we don't offend the lady by being uncouth. And you get a chance to go up in the world. Just put your finger on a button. Now, uh, wait a Come minute. Come on. All right. Now, all you have to do is push. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, the most famous neighbors in radio, the Ronald Coleman's, will pay Jack Benny a visit again tomorrow as CBS's great Sunday night gets underway with another star-studded group of famous entertainers. Amos and Andy, Lum and Abner, Eve Arden as the gay schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks, and Helen Hayes as a hillbilly. These are only four more of the ten great entertainments which will come your way tomorrow night. Go visiting with the Coleman's on all of these same stations on the Jack Benny Show and hear the rest of CBS's great Sunday Night 10 as they come one by one over most of these stations. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Friend from Detroit. cage on cables was ten exasperating seconds getting to the next floor. And I was another ten getting free of it back down the stairs and out into the dark street where the red splash of a taillight disappeared around a corner. And that was all that was left of Foghorn and company. So I turned back toward Carla Borden's room. And when I stepped across the threshold, I found that with the exception of a single bureau that was still intact, apartment number 17 looked like it had just played host to the vortex of a cyclone. A bed, a chest of drawers, another bureau, a desk, everything was inside out. And in the middle of all that was the body of Carla Borden. Blood from a deep, ugly cut on her head, staining the snow-white front of her Angora sweater. I saw something else, which reminded me that this was not the first corpse of the night. The plush leather frame was shaped like an oversized lifesaver, and in it was the picture of a handsome man, all smiles, inscribed, With love to my very best girl. Speck Willard. It was ten minutes before I got Tennedy Barrow, who was still up at the Beverly Crest Hotel. And after I told him about Collar and her connection with the late Mr. Willard and Betty Pryor and my connection with Dave, I stopped talking and listened. Marla, we just learned that Willard had some kind of a $25,000 caper going with one of his old mobster friends from Detroit, named Joe Lazar. Who maybe is something with a voice and active below bottom? The same, Phil. Anyhow, it looks like they worked out a gambling deal for old time's sake. At the last minute, Willard tried to welch on Lazar and got killed for his trouble. 
Then Lazar searched the place until he found the 25000 No, no, no. That part doesn't fit, Ibarra. How so? Well, I've run into Lazar twice tonight. I know he and the money are still strangers. Oh? After what happened here with the team of Betty and Lazar getting to the singer Carla, I figure they're still looking for it. Also, I figure Carla was somewhere near when Lazar killed Speck Willard and that she took the money and... I'll call you later, Ibarra. We got clumsy company in the hall outside. All right, ballerina, get your foot out of that bucket and come on in with your hands up. Well, <laughs> the man with a very long nose for news. What brings you around, Remini? For one thing, the fact that you got no corner on brains, Marlowe, and for another, who did that to her? Our mutual friend, Betty Pryor, and her running mate. I believe they were looking for 25,000 bucks. Did she and Joe Lazar get the money, Marlowe? No, they... Hey, Remini, how did you know the man with Betty was named Joe Lazar? Haven't you heard? I'm a good reporter, Marlowe. The mm. kind of keeps eyes and ears open and mouth shut. It isn't until I know the whole story. Which, as far as you're concerned, is precisely what? That I happen to you be... You happen to be? That I happen to be in Dave's restaurant early this evening where I recognize the only other cash customer is Joe Lazar. Oh. An out-of-work mobster from Detroit. He said something to Betty that scared her right out of a tray of dishes, so I figured I'd find out what was going on. I've been in on the show ever since. Yeah. Including a corny blackout up at 2000 Beachwood Drive where you lost your hat running away from a bullet. That's right. Uh-huh. And just so you don't toss and turn when you get around to going to bed tonight, I'll fill in the rest. I followed Betty and Dave from the restaurant to their apartment. I watched her get rid of Dave, and then when I saw Lazar come in, I moved up close to the window. And stayed there. Until Lazar spotted you and threw a bullet your way? You're very clever. Yes, I am, man. But before that happened, I heard him tell Betty that Speck Willard had talked about a girl singer at the Starkiss room named uh, Carla Borden. And that since he didn't know Carla on sight, she could have been the lady he'd seen running out of Speck's apartment with a 25 gram. Oh. Now that phone book of Dave's open to the bees ties in. I'm so glad. Now, Marlowe, lest we digress too far, how come this one bureau here hasn't been turned upside down along with everything else? I don't know. Any more than I know why you're holding back so much from the law. Well, maybe it's because I don't like cops, Marla. Oh, black ones. Or maybe it's because I'm in the same kind of racket as you. Chin way out and a lot of fast talk, just so papers can know what's going on an hour ahead of the rest of the world. Well, there's no 25000 in here. I got a blow. Before Ibarra shows? Before Ibarra shows. He always arrives with an entourage, Marla, one that includes other news hounds. So it's me for a fast cab and downtown to my paper with a story. Go on, fellow. I'll see you around. Hey, wait a minute, Remini. Yeah? I'll give you a lift. I'm going that way myself. Okay. I got a story, too. A lousy story. I've got to tell a nice guy named Dave. Come on. All the time we drove, Remini half-faced me and smoked one cigarette after another while he rattled on about Joe Lazar. The great story he had and a lot of other things I didn't hear because I was busy trying to find the right words with which to tell Dave Pryor that his wife was no good. So when we were about halfway to Beachwood Drive and Remini, who was pushing close to his deadline, decided to get out and phone his story in from a drugstore, I was glad. So long, Marlo. A second after that, I knew I was kidding myself. Because even with just silence for company, I was still no place with the right words. Ten minutes later, when I stood in front of Dave on the steps to his house and stammered out the facts just as I had run across them, I forgot about words, right or wrong. I thought instead about my client, a badly hurt guy, but one who would never say die. Marlo, I can't believe all this. I won't. Tell me, where's Betty now? I don't know, Dave. Now, look, maybe we ought to head for police headquarters because sooner or later we're each going to have a story to tell Lieutenant Ibarra. Come on, my car's over here. Okay, Phil. I guess that's the only thing to do, all right? Yeah, I guess so. Here. Better have a cigarette, Davy. Oh, thanks. Kid, we'll try to make this as painless as we... As we what, Marlo? What is it? Hmm? Well, what are you staring at? Front seat. But I don't see anything, Phil. What is it? What shut are you up, staring Dave. At? Shut up. Give me a minute, will you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Come on, Dave. Pile in. But why, Marla? Where are we going? Star kiss room to play a long shot. I slapped my foot down hard on the accelerator and kept it that way right through a string of I didn't care what color traffic lights until five minutes later when we screeched to a stop away from the side entrance to the star kiss room. 
I left Abe in the front seat, piled out fast, and ran a dozen yards to an abrupt halt. At the sight of something that turned the long shot I was playing into a into an odds-on favorite. It was the stage entrance door open a couple of inches, and in front of that, and unconscious on the hard sidewalk where it had fallen, was the clad in blue form of a private patrolman, his pistol holster conspicuously empty. <laughs> Inside, I slowly picked my way along an L-shaped corridor until I saw a shaft of bright yellow from a flashlight that was moving away from a door marked Carla Borden. It brought me up short and flat against the wall. But then as the man on the other end of the beam of light moved away from me, I, I got a very steady grip on the thirty-eight in my pocket and started after him. A minute later, he entered the main room of the club and it was there as he started across the glass ceiling dance floor. But I recognized the very self-confident gait of a very self-confident guy. And that made the next move mine. Bar's closed, what? Remini, and don't move, Buster. I'll blow your head off. Ah, looks like you're making news this time, good reporter. Or isn't that package in your hand the 25 grand you just found in Carla Borden's dressing room, huh? The same Carla Borden you murdered not an hour ago in an apartment on Lucerne, where you first thought the money was where Betty Pryor surprised you before you could finish searching, where you later returned in the role of an all-American newsboy so you could get to that last bureau. All right, all right, I've heard enough, Marlowe. But I'm not going to stick around for more details. You make a break and I'll shoot Remini. Try it, Eagle. Stop, eye. Remini, stop! Uh, Marlowe! Uh, uh. Nice shooting, Marlowe. But don't turn around because where I'm standing, it's dark. And where you're standing, it's light. Now throw your gun away, fella. Come on, toss it! All right, Betty. Get over to that dead newspaper guy and get the money. All and we'll right. take care of the private detective here. What do you mean, take care, Joe? I, I can't go along with murder. Speck Willard's death didn't seem to bother you any. Shut up, Marlowe. Speck Willard. Joe, you... Joe, you killed... Yes, I killed Speck, that... Well, sure. Eight o'clock tonight. And I had to stay under cover, but still get my hands on the money. So, I came to you for help. But I didn't tell you about the killing because I didn't think you'd play ball if you knew about it. Now, all that's history now, and I'll still go to your dear husband, Dave, and talk lots about the kind of cheap kid you used to be in Detroit if you don't get moving. Now, what do you say, Betty? I say no, Joe. I also say I made a mistake in the first place letting you use me to run your filthy errands just so the guy I love wouldn't have to know about the kind of people I once ran around with before I had any brains. All right. If that's the dumb way you want it, that's the dumb way it'll be. Taking care of two years is much harder than taking care of one. What about three, Lazar? Dave! Dave, stay back! No, Marlo, no. I've stayed back too long already. I've stayed back while Betty has been risking her life to protect what we've got. If you take another step out, shoot, kid. I'm warning you for the last time. Stay back! No, Lazar, I won't! Ah! You no. thinking scum, Lazar! Dave! Oh, Dave, you're hit! Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'll be all right. I'll be all right now, Betty. Dr. Reese, Dr. Reese, please report to surgery. Well, Mrs. Pryor, Dr. Reese, Harlow, the please doctor says that Dave's going to surgery. be fine in a couple of days. Yeah. Caught one on the shoulder, the other on the hip. He certainly had courage, didn't he? Yeah, and you did all right, too, Betty. Mixing in this whole mess just to keep the home fires burning. Oh. Tell me, whatever Dr. made you Reese, think that a guy like Dave wouldn't understand that you surgery. turned over a new leaf? Well, Dr. I... Reese wanted in I surgery. don't know, Phil. I guess I wasn't very smart. No, you weren't, Mrs. Pryor, but you're lucky because Marlowe here was. And that brings me around to a loose end, Phil. How did you know that Remini was your man? No, that. Because of something I saw in the upholstery of the front seat of my car, Ibarra. Tufts of Snow White Angora, which was the kind of sweater that Carla Borden had on when she was murdered after they struggled. And since you didn't touch the body yourself, they couldn't have come from your suit. No. And Remini was the only other one who had been in my car. So I figured that the Angora fuzz had gone from Carla's sweater to Remini's suit to my upholstery. Yeah. All of which means that Remini must have been in Carla's room before I got there as well as after, see? And then once I thought back about his getting out of my car to phone his story in, I... Well, I realized that when I dropped him near a drugstore, he had also been near the star kiss room. Yes. That's exactly where he'd headed. Mm -hmm. You see, Phil, Joe and I followed both of you from Carla Borden's place because, well, after Joe put you in that elevator and we ran, Joe said we had to return and wait for Remini, who was sure to come back and finish his search. 
And the whole business because Lazar, after he had murdered Speck Willard, was afraid to publicly go after Carla Borden. And the money he felt was his. Yes. And he knew about me and Dave because Speck Willard accidentally dropped into our place this morning. Uh, correction, for... baby. What? Yesterday morning. Oh. It's now 9 a.m. Oh. <clears throat> and a good time to call quits, huh? <laughs> good night, kids. By the time I got back to my apartment on Franklin, it was half past ten in the too bright morning. I was sporting sandpaper eyelids and a knot in the small of my back that felt like a wet dish rag. Oh, but once I had all the shades down and was undressed and in bed, I forgot about that. And I thought instead of the wood nymph dressed in nothing, hmm, with a veil of dewdrops. But then suddenly I stopped. The telephone. I got out of bed. I picked it up with both hands, opened the dresser drawer, and jammed it deep under all the socks I owned. And then I got back to bed. And the wood nymph, in her veil of dewdrops, she was, she was pirouetting from one huge bluebell to another. Oh, my... On gossamer wing. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg as Betty Pryor, Peter Leeds as Dave Pryor, Harry Bartell as Van Remini, and Ed Begley as Joe Lazar. Lieutenant Detective Ibarra was played by Jeff Corey. The special music was by Richard O'Ron. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was a hunt through a jungle of city streets with danger waiting at every intersection until halfway through when the hunters became the hunted and death brought an end to the game. Coleman's visiting Jack Benny, plus Amos and Andy, Eve Arden, and Helen Hayes as a hillbilly. Yes, that earlier announcement about CBS programs tomorrow night sounded great, didn't it? Except you Philip Marlowe fans may have been wondering, isn't there a mystery show among that great Sunday night 10 on CBS? Of course there is. One of the great detectives in the mystery world, Dashiell Hammett's one and only Sam Spade. Sam will be here, hard-hitting, fast-moving as always, tomorrow night on most of the same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of the same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It was a hunt through a jungle of city streets with danger waiting at every intersection until halfway through when the hunters became the hunted and death brought an end to the game. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, 
The Grim Hunters. The morning paper had headlined prices rising. My bank statement in the afternoon mail had worn balance falling. And I had wasted the evening on behalf of a client who ran out on me when I tried to collect. All of which added up to the end of the day and me unhappy in my office at 10 p.m. With one hand on my checkbook and the other one raised in almost solemn oath. I, Philip Marlowe, private detective and too often public servant, hereby resolve to one way or another jockey my budget into something close to equilibrium. And from this day for... Hello. Marlowe speaking. My name is Helen Palmer, Marlowe. I need your help badly. Yeah, but look, I... I'm up at 8700 Magnolia Terrace in the Hollywood Hills. Now, please, drop whatever you're doing and... No. No. No! I must have let go of the phone, grabbed my hat and coat, opened and closed the office door, piled into my car outside and raced up into the Hollywood Hills because... The next thing I remember after Helen Palmer's scream was swinging off North Bronson Drive onto Magnolia Terrace. But a minute later, when I scraped to a stop away from number 8700, scrambled out from under the wheel and started on the run for the front door, I was no longer sure of anything. Because the house in question, a stock southern mansion, complete with stable boy statue in the gravel driveway, which according to the book should have been as dark and as quiet as the inside of a coffin, was anything else but... And when I got to the oversized bronze door knocker and dropped it hard, I was beginning to doubt that I had the right address. Can I be of some assistance, sir? I don't know. I'm looking for a woman named Helen Palmer who called me at my office. Said she needed help. And a second after that, she... Screamed, huh? <laughs> Tell me, sir, what is your name and occupation? In that order, Philip Marlowe, private detective. <laughs> good for Helen, good for Happy, girl. aren't you? What's going on here? What is this? Why, it's a party, sir. A scavenger hunt. It looks like Helen Palmer's the way... Now, wait a minute, laughing boy. I had a call that was interrupted by pistol shots, and I... (laughs) All just part of the play, sir. Yeah, Helen Palmer had to bring back one private detective. (laughs) Yeah, you see, Marlowe, each list, aside from the usual hard-to-find object, had a human being on it. That's right. I had to bring back a Hoover vacuum cleaner salesman, and believe it or not, he's already sold our good host, Thaddeus Grover, the deluxe model. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, he did it bad. <laughs> you see, Mr. Marlowe, Helen Palmer wasn't permitted to actually hire you. That's why she had to pretend to be in trouble. With well, a net result that I nearly broke my neck getting up here. Mr. Grover, where is Miss Palmer? Well, I don't know for sure, Marlowe. She called just a bit ago and said that she only had to catch on to you and one other item and would be back after that. Which makes her the winner, Mr. Marlowe, because none of us did better than half our list. Oh, by the by, you don't happen to have the breech lock of a 57-millimeter anti-tank gun with you. <laughs> At the moment, no. Nor do I have time for scavenger hunters. Not even when they most cordially invite you in with the finest serve and the party style southern fried chicken imaginable. Come on, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I... Come on, come on, well, come on. Come it's on. delicious chicken. Well, okay, the chicken did it. (laughs) (laughs) The inside of Thaddeus Grover's house was also stocked southern mansion from a giant cut glass punch bowl. Belonged to my mother, sir, first lady of Atlanta, Georgia, sir, to a wide and winding colonial staircase. It left you expecting the descent of Scarlett O'Hara at any moment. There was one strange note in the soft southern surroundings. Piled three feet high in the middle of the room were the crazy quilt results of the evening scavenger hunt including a wooden cigar store Indian, a pair of Hickok suspenders from the local fire chief, one red motorcycle, a stuffed owl, a set of antlers, and more. And behind all that, my counterparts, the bring-em-back-alive items from each list, a streetcar conductor in uniform, a waiter bald and under 40, a schoolteacher red-headed and over 50. But I was the center of attention. But Thaddeus introduced one after another of the guests to the genuine, 100% non-shrinkable private detective. And now, Mr. Marlowe, sir, a very special friend of mine. At 31, sir, the president of Sample and Claiborne, best building contractors in the city of Los Angeles. Oh, that's so very interesting, Mr. Grover. Yeah, moreover, Mr. Marlowe, Sample made it right to the top in the past two years. Uh-huh. Yeah, ever since old Joshua Claiborne got killed falling off a scaffold. He did. Because between you and me and the gatepost, some folks say it was 
was suicide. Oh, Larry, Larry uh, boy, I, I'd like you to meet Mr. Marlowe, private detective. Mr. Marlowe, Larry Sam. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Glad you're with us. Uh, Hideous, has Rhonda called in yet? Last time I heard from her was when we split our list in two and... She headed out after a Latin American rumba team. <laughs> well, if she went after a boss, she'll bring her back. That's Rhonda Langley we're speaking of, Mr. Marlowe, Larry's lady friend. Oh? Nicest person I know, except, of course, my fiancée, Helen. Helen is in Palmer, my patron, Mr. Grover. <laughs> yes, sir, one and the same, sir. Well, we certainly have a lot of fun, even if we don't make much money, eh, Marlowe? Yeah, you certainly... <laughs> Mr. Grover, did you say money? Most surely did, boy. No. You know, dollars and cents. Yes. Well, gentlemen, you'll excuse me, please, but I do have to run. Good night, Mr. Sample. Right. And Mr. Grover, sir, it's been a distinct pleasure, sir. I bid you goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. Your card. <laughs> <laughs> I got back to my office, which I had left lights on and unlocked. My telephone was ringing. At this late hour, gullible me took faint hope that it could be a client who might still save the day. When I picked up the receiver... Marlo? I let go of that straw fast. Marlo? It was Detective Lieutenant Ibarra. Marlo, do you know a girl named Helen Palmer? Helen Palmer? Hey, Ibarra, don't tell me there's a pair of somewhat flat feet on the lady's scavenger hunt list. Very funny, Phil. How do you know her? No, not beyond a panic telephone call that ended in a make-believe scream and a couple of pistol shots... All designed to bring me running to a party at 8700 Magnolia Terrace. Mm-hmm. Well, that adds all right, because the only items not checked off a list are a night watchman's badge and one detective private, which must be you, since your name is circled in the classified directory here in this phone booth. Here in what phone booth? Where are you, Ibarra? At a closed filling station on Van Ness off Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, well, wait a minute. Why is a girl's list there with you? Because it's clenched in her right hand, Phil, and she's folded up on the floor of this booth, dead. Oh, no. Two bullet holes in her back. Oh, yeah, but, but Ibarra, her call was a gag. The shots weren't. Anyhow, it looks like a stick-up since the lady's purse is gone and a wino we Who? picked up. A wino we picked up saw what he calls a curly-headed guy with short legs do it and run. Also, the wino says that the murderer had been hanging around for a couple of hours like he was looking for a well-to-do prospect. Yeah, I know, but it's still kind of strange. Me getting that call, I mean. Well, I'll drop around to headquarters tomorrow morning, Lieutenant, if you need any statement from me. I think you'd better make that tonight, Phil. At the 8700 address. I'm sending Mooney up there now. Oh, but wait a minute, Ibarra. You don't need me, and I do need business. If you think I'm going to get it by... Phil. Huh? Phil, let's say that I'd appreciate it if you'd show for a few minutes. Okay? No. Well, okay, a few minutes. Just so long as you appreciate it. Goodbye. Driving back to Magnolia Terrace, I used Detective Lieutenant Ibarra as an oversized whipping boy for the day's disappointments. So when I finally break to a stop behind a half-parked squad car, which meant that Police Officer Mooney was already on hand, I was about back to normal. But then in the next quick moment, I forgot all about Ibarra because in the shadows ahead, sneaking away from a side entrance to number 8700, and looking as guilty as Lucretia Borgia leaving a corner pharmacy, was a young lady, brunette and beautiful. She hurried directly to a gray Nash parked in the rear and, without looking back, climbed in and took off. Following her had to be more fun than conversation with Mooney. <laughs> Ten minutes later, the lady came to a stop in front of a dark, politely landscaped cottage on North Ogden Drive. In another two, she was inside and the light was on. When I got to the front door and leaned against the bell, a card over it said that this could be one Rhonda Langley, Mr. Larry Sample's girlfriend. But that same card also gave another name, Helen Palmer, the lady dead in booth. I rang again. When the door opened, it was the brunette, still beautiful. Only this time, something had been added. In her right hand, a forty-five, ugly and pointed straight at my head. What do you want? One straight answer, Miss Langley. <clears throat> Why did you run away from 8700 Magnolia Terrace? And a cop with routine questions. Wait a minute. Who are you? How do you know my name? I'm a private detective labeled Philip Marlowe. Item number eight on the late Miss Palmer's list. And I know about you because I've already been to Thaddeus Grover's party. Now, after you put this gun away, <clears throat> we'll get back to my question. Why'd you run? Come on, talk, lady, now before I yell copper. Well, all right. Come in. Thanks. Mr. Marlowe, I don't think Helen Palmer's murder was any run-of-the-mill robbery. You don't think what? I stayed just long enough to hear the policeman say Helen had been killed. Oh. 
When I got to your welcome, Matt, I was greeted with a 45. Talk some more, Miss Langley. Real plain well, like, right. huh? Give me half a chance, will you? I didn't say anything to the police about this because I don't want to do any damage before I'm sure about a few things. Like what? Like the kind of a mess that Helen was in. Mr. Marlowe, I need help. I- I've got to know some facts. Please, will you work for me? I'll pay you anything. Well, at this point, let's call anything 25 a day in expenses, huh? Uh, about Helen and the mess you spoke of, how much do you know? Very little. Only that I think Helen was blackmailing somebody. Somebody who was at the party tonight. Like Grover, your boyfriend Larry Sample? I don't know. Oh, you've got to believe me, Mr. Marlowe. Well, all right. For the time being, I will. Now, first of all, how'd you latch on to this blackmail? Well, yesterday morning, I accidentally overheard Helen talking to someone on the telephone. She spoke of a payoff that was to be made at Thaddeus's party. I don't know who she was talking to, but she warned the person not to try anything rash. As in murder? She didn't say. But she did say that she'd already airmailed a letter to her lawyers in San Francisco that would protect her from any harm. And she laughed about the scheduled scavenger hunt and hung up. Mm-hmm. You said nothing to her about this, huh? Well, no, I, I was afraid... All right, the letter to San Francisco. Did you see her mail it? Well, I mailed it myself earlier in the day, along with one of my own. Mm-hmm. I didn't think about it until after her call, when she pointedly asked me if I'd remembered to mail a letter. Uh, my letter, that is. Which she knew that I'd written to an aunt I have in Passaic, New Jersey. Well? Well, that's the whole story. If you want me, I'll be over at Thaddeus's place. Thaddeus? Yes. He was in love with Helen. Yeah. Maybe she was returning that love with blackmail. What do you think, Rhonda? I don't know. The thinking is now your job, Mr. Marlowe. When I left Rhonda Langley and started back to my car as a bona fide private detective with client, I wasn't sure whether or not I was happy about the whole thing. But a second later, at the sight of a man in the dark ahead, half crouched behind a tree, I quit deliberating the point and got ready for trouble because... From what I could see, the gentleman in hiding had both the curly hair and very short legs that Ibarra had mentioned as a sign of Helen Palmer's killer. I kept walking straight until I was abreast of the tree, and then I pivoted sharply. Took one step toward him and swung! <laughs> Come on, brother. Why, you dirty... You haven't got the time! They believe me! Enough, fella. Enough, will you leave me alone? Sure. Sure I will. After you start talking. Now, get up! Okay. Okay, don't hit me again. I'll talk. I'll tell you everything. Hey. Hey, look there. No! No, don't! Oh, that lousy nut. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, you can do a lot of singing for $14,500, so they say. And tonight, some CBS listener may be able to speak with authority on the subject because $14,500 is what's waiting for whoever can solve the mystery behind the new Phantom Voice on CBS's great Saturday night quiz game, Sing It Again. Listeners from coast to coast will be quizzed by telephone about the new Phantom's identity. And they'll also be given a chance to win one of the other famous prizes for solving the riddle songs which feature Sing It Again's Hour of Saturday Night Fun. Here, Sing It Again on most of these same CBS network stations tonight and every Saturday night. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Grim Hunters. Shots crashed out of the darkness. The life ran out of the little man like air from a kid's balloon. I couldn't figure exactly where the shots had come from, and I stopped trying when a pair of spiked heels clicked fast across the concrete driveway between me and the house. Then a motor started, and a second later, a car roared by with Ronda Langley at the wheel. I yelled at her to stop as she went by and ran out in the street after her and yelled again at the retreating car. But she ignored me. When another car came around the curb behind me, I tried to flag it down, but the driver didn't even slow up. So I just stood there while the two cars twisted out of sight down the winding street, leaving nothing but silence and a lot of unanswered questions hanging in midair. I walked back to the corpse, went over it carefully. But there was no identification, nothing but a gun to indicate how he fitted into the screwy mosaic of murder, scavenging, and blackmail. I went inside to call Ibarra, and five minutes of tracers, relays, and busy signals went by before I finally got through to him with my news about Helen Palmer's killer. What? Uh, where are you, Marlowe? 
In our house on Ogden Drive, 4310 North, was shared by Helen Palmer, my new client, Rhonda Langley. Uh-huh. Did she kill my suspect, Marl? It could be. She left here in a big hurry. Another thing he borrowed, there's more behind this business than robbery. Like what? Like blackmail. Maybe so. We just found the Palmer's girl handbag in a trash can. Nothing left but a lipstick and two letters. Incidentally, one is addressed to your client, Rhonda Langley. That figures. They shared the house, so Helen happened to pick up the day's mail. What's the other letter? It was one return for insufficient postage. They forgot that air mail is six cents these days. A return? Wait a minute. Is that letter addressed to a law firm in San Francisco? No, it's addressed to Sophie Kilberty. Sophie Kill who? Kilberty of oh. Passaic, New Jersey. Why? Well, Ibarra, listen. Helen was blackmailing somebody, and she covered herself by mailing a letter to her lawyers in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. If that letter was returned for insufficient postage and the blackmail victim knew it, he'd have no qualms about killing her, right? Sure, but the letters were in Helen's purse. Oh. Don't you think she'd have known her protection was gone? Phil, I'm going to put out a pickup call on your client. And you get on down here so we can go over this mess one step at a time. Where's here? Still at the gas station on Van Ness off Hollywood Boulevard. Okay, Barra. How long are you going to be there? Just until Thaddeus Grover shows up to identify the body and give me some answers personally about that scavenger hunt he threw tonight. What about this curly-headed corpse I've got here? Have you gone over him? Yeah, yeah. Nothing but a gun, some small bills on him. Then he'll keep. I'll expect you in a few minutes. Okay. So long, Ibarra. When I put down the phone, I was convinced that a big switch was due any minute because... Finding those letters in Helen Palmer's purse made a lot of sense in one direction and not a bit in another. I could have made more heads and tails by flipping a ball bearing than I got out of the facts he borrowed given me. Just then, the shadow of a man slid up the walk. I heard a pair of feet mount the stairs two at a time. It was the Wonder Boy executive I'd met at the party. Better hold it right there, Sample. What? Marlowe. Why the gun? So the same thing won't happen to me that happened to the dead little guy outside? Another murder? Marlowe, where's Rhonda? Is she all right? She left here as fast as an eight-cylinder motor wide open could move just after it happened. Then it was Rhonda I saw. On my way over here, a speeding car almost crowded me off the road. It looked like Rhonda's, but I wasn't sure. And Marlowe, she was being chased by another car, a fast one. Chased, are you sure? Yes. The first car missed me by inches when it swung around a curve. I don't know yet how she made it. Then a second car came along and passed the curve, but it stopped, backed up, and then took the same road Rhonda had taken. You think she got away? I don't know. Hmm. Well, come on outside, Sample. I want you to take a look at this. By the way, how long have you known Rhonda? About a year. Mm -hmm. She's a brilliant girl, Marlowe. Came out from the East, and I gave her a job as my secretary. She's more than that now, huh? I'm in love with her, if that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here it is. Well, Marlowe, I... I know this man. That's Nate Murdoch. He used to be a foreman with our firm. He left and went back to Atlanta right after Claiborne's death. Atlanta? Isn't your host Thaddeus Grover from Atlanta? Why, yes, he is. Oh, brother. When did you see Grover last? Well, the police asked him to go and identify Helen's body. He left the party while the officer was still questioning the rest of us. Yeah, and on the way, he could have taken time off to drop by here, kill Murdoch, and make a try for Rhonda, too. Come on, let's get to the phone. But why, Marlowe? Good heavens, Grover's our friend. He and Helen were engaged to be married. All right, so it doesn't make sense. But his fiance and his short friend from Atlanta are both dead. And Rhonda's burning the tires off a car to keep out of reach. Those are the facts. It'll make sense later. Now, call Grover's place and hurry up. Yes. That's where she intended to go when she left here, to console him, no less. Scavenger hunt my Aunt Minnie. If, hello? Hello, is Mr. Grover there? No? Well, has Miss Langley arrived yet? Oh, it's the maid, Marlowe. Mm -hmm. Rhonda had... What's that? She's coming up the walk now? Uh, hold the line a minute, please. She just got there, Marlowe. What'll I tell her? Tell her to leave again. Tell her... No. Where do you live? 4406 Ardmore. All right. Tell her I said for her to wait outside in the back of the house until you can get over there to pick her up. Take her to your place and I'll pin Grover down. Right. Where are you going now? See Lieutenant Ibarra, and I can get there faster than I can call him on the phone. Good luck, Sample. <laughs> Sample was repeating my name over to Grover's maid on the phone as I left. And a few minutes later, at the mobile gas station off Hollywood Boulevard, I found Ibarra looking sardonic in the blinking light from a flying red neon horse above his head. As he flipped through a stack of papers on top of an oil drum. It's about time, Arlo. Where's that client of yours? Now, wait a minute, Ibarra. I had her pegged all wrong. She's a pigeon. Has Thaddeus Grover been here yet? Just left. He's quite a character, that guy. You didn't let him get away alone? Yes, he was... What do you mean, get away? Ibarra, there's a, there's a big connection between Thaddeus Grover and Murdoch, the guy who killed Helen. Now, Grover might have hired him for the job. 
And now he's trying to get Rhonda. Now, Marlowe, how does that figure? It doesn't, but so help me, Barlow, that's the way it is. Well, Grove was heading for his friend Larry Sample's house when he left. Happened to know where Sample... Holy smoke, that's exactly where I told Sample to take the girl. 4406 Ardmore. Well, that's great, Marlowe. They'll all be together in one place. I'll pick up the whole crew in right now. You're going to pick up the pieces, you mean? You think there'll be a showdown? Any minute he bar, it can't miss. Okay, so we'll take some firepower along. Hey, McAuliffe. Great. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Come on, Phil. Now look, Ibarra, maybe Sample hasn't gotten home with Rhonda yet. I'll go up to Grover's and try to head them off, okay? Okay, Marlowe. But if you get them before I do, bring them in. And no alibis. I'll see you. Ibarra was grim as he climbed in his car and drove off fast. I headed for my car then. As I turned, my arm swept the scavenger list Ibarra had left on the oil drum off onto the ground. When I picked them up, Rhonda Langley's name was on top. Her list was as goony as the others, but near the bottom was an item strangely familiar to me, which hadn't been checked off. It was a canceled ticket from Woodhaven Ballroom. All at once, I realized why it was familiar. The sign I'd been half conscious of on top of the big squat building across the street read, Woodhaven Ballroom, closed tonight. On a hunch, I dug for Helen Palmer's list. Yeah, Ibarra was right. Everything but a night watchman's badge and one detective private had been checked off. And that gave me half of the switch I knew I had to show up. I ran to my car and headed for that southern mansion in the Hollywood Hills. In the end of a very complicated frolic. And with every turn of the road, I gave myself another whack for being such a nearsighted sucker. When I got there, the big house on Magnolia Terrace was dark, except for a light in the servants' quarters. I stepped down the block, walked back, and edged around to the patio where the garage, the hothouse, and the king-sized barbecue loomed only as... Shapeless lumps of shadow. I stood still and watched. Then I saw him move, walking slowly, gun in hand along the fence toward the hothouse. I started toward him quietly, just as he found out what he was looking for. Oh, you're clever, my dear. But it's all over now. I know you're in there, so come on out with your hands up. Oh, no. You're hanging yourself for murder right now, Larry Sample. I've got all the proof I need. I don't know what good it'll do you, Rhonda. I'll never pay you a cent for it, you blackmailing tramp. I'll kill you first. And that protection letter you wrote to your lawyers was returned, darling. I found it accidentally in Helen's purse tonight at the party. So no one will know. Now, come on out, or I'm going in after you. I wouldn't try that if I were you, Sample. Marlowe's due here any minute now. He called me and told me. That was I, dear. You? I used his name when I talked to the maid. Oh, I should have done this myself in the first place instead of trusting that stupid Murdoch. Are you going to come out of there? No, and I've got a gun. You can't see me, and I know it. Your white dress makes a perfect target, you little fool. Drop it, Sample. Now let's have that gun. Well, I'm so glad you got here. No, no, he's not dead. And he won't be from bullets. Give me your gun, too, huh? Come on. All right. I I was too scared to use it anyway. Thanks. Now sit down and shut up. We're going to wait for Lieutenant Ibarra, then you're both going to the pokey. Listen, you, I don't go for blackmailers, male or female. Even the cute ones are ugly, lady. Very ugly. Oh, Phil, wait. You've got to understand something. Two years ago, Larry Sample killed his partner, Joshua Claiborne. I knew it, but I couldn't prove it. So I pretended I could and blackmailed him. Don't you see, if he paid off or or tried to kill me, that would be proof of his guilt. And he did, Marlowe. Mm-hmm. Why should you pull a stunt like that? I'm a divorcee, Marlowe. Langley is only my married name. Okay, so what? My maiden name was Claiborne. Claiborne? I'm Josh Claiborne's daughter. Oh. And I can prove that. Is that reason enough? Well, why didn't you level with me instead of labeling Helen a blackmailer? Helen was already dead, and I needed your help desperately. I thought I had to lie to get it. Okay? Yeah. Okay, baby. Anyone care for more coffee? How about you, Lieutenant? Oh, no thanks, Mr. Grover. <clears throat> well, Marlo, you got it all to come out even anyway. <laughs> Frankly, that's more than I expected, and I left you at that gas station. Yeah, yeah, we were lucky, Burra. I, uh, I guess I owe you an apology, Mr. Grover. Oh, Chuck, that's all right, son. It was a shock to me to be accused of poor Helen's murder, but, well, it's over now. Yeah. Uh... You said it was the scavenger list that set you straight. How'd you figure that, boy? Well, there was a Woodhaven ballroom ticket on Rhonda's list, so she had to go there for the ticket, you see. Uh A sample knew that. 
And he told his killer, Murdoch, who incidentally he hired to murder Claiborne two years ago, that the girl who went to the Woodhaven ballroom was his target. Uh Uh-huh. But Helen happened to go there after the night watchman's badge. Which she could have picked up any place in town. Yeah. What a terrible coincidence for Helen. That that was all that saved my life, really. That's right, honey. Murdoch made the mistake, and when he and Sample discovered it, they made another try at Rhonda's house. But I caught Murdoch there, so Sample shot him before he could talk. And when I left, he followed me in his car. I knew they were after me, and I thought for sure they'd killed you, Phil. That's why I ran. Yeah. That threw me for a loop. And Sample came back to make sure that Murdoch was dead and sold me a great big bill of goods at the same time. Ah, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Yes, Mr. Grover, it is. Uh, Lieutenant, I want to thank you personally for your participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I've got everything I need, so I'll say good night. Yeah, me too. Oh, I... Phil? <clears throat> yes? Shall I mail you a check? Why, yes, I, I think... Uh... No, no, no. Wait a minute. Yes? You know, honey, with uh, with your knowledge of postal rates, uh, why don't you uh, just deliver it in person, maybe? Huh? <laughs> Love to. Count on it, Mr. Marlowe. Good night. I drove down from the Hollywood Hills with a check warming my wallet and the echo of a soft invitation warming my imagination. You know, that was quite a party at Grover's house. (laughs) Scavenger hunt. People determined to have a good time even if it killed them. You know what? It did. I know another game. Associations. It goes like this. Grover's party. Rhonda Langley. Rhonda... Hmm date. Hmm. I wonder if she likes baseball. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Ellen Reed, Mary Shipp, Jack Moyles, Richard Benedict, and Lorette Philbrandt. Lieutenant Detective Abar is played by Jeff Corey. The special music is by Richard Orant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... They were born on the same hour and the same day of the same parents. And they were identical in beauty and talent. Only one was deadly and the other was not. And I couldn't tell which was which until I found a green purse, a fresh corpse, and a pair of dancing hands. If you happened to miss Jack Benny's hilarious show last week featuring the Ronald Coleman's, you missed the laugh treat of the year. But Jack will be back again tomorrow on these same CBS network stations with his entire gang, including Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, Don Wilson, and the Sportsman's Quartet. Invite some friends over. Sit back and enjoy the Jack Benny Show tomorrow. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. born at the same hour on the same day of the same parents, and they were identical in beauty and talent. Only one was deadly, but the other was not, and I couldn't tell which was which until I found a green purse, a fresh corpse, and a pair of dancing hands. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, 
with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Dancing Hands. The telegram I found stuck in the mail slot when I got back to my office after a long and roundabout day read. Enclosed find a $50 money order. I want you to investigate a man. A table is reserved for you at the saddle club where I work. Come in time for the second show at 11, important. It was signed Beth Tyler. So at a quarter to 11, with 50 bucks worth of inspiration behind me, I drove over the Coenga Freeway and out Ventura to the saddle club, which pretended to be old English by showing its beams through a flagstone facade. I went in the carefully rough-hewn oak door, and even before my eyes became adjusted to the cozy lack of candle power inside... Neil Redmond, owner and operator of the place, glided toward me, sporting his genial host smile, which tonight was even more forced than usual. How are you, Marlo? It's been a long time. Business a pleasure, Phil. It's always a pleasure to come to the saddle club, Neil. I've even got a reservation. You know my food better than that, Marlo. Uh-huh. <laughs> Just don't let it get rough, will you? Come on, I'll find your table out front. I want you to see this show. A pair of twins in a twin piano act that's sensational. Yeah? Edie and Beth Tyler. Oh, here, how's this? Fine. Incidentally, uh, Edie will be the one on the left. Well, if they're twins, what's the difference? Plenty. Edie may be Mrs. Redmond one of these days. Oh. Mrs. Redmond, but you are wanted on the phone, sir. Uh, get the number, George, and I'll call back. This gentleman said you would talk to him, sir. It is uh, Mr. Paul Cedar. Paul Cedar. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Excuse me, Marlo. Uh, this is important. I better take it. Redmond reacted to the name Cedar like a punch in the nose. But I figured that was none of my business, which was more than I could say for a flabby, dough-faced character at the next table who followed the nightclub owner all the way out of the room with a pair of watery red eyes, which he deliberately avoided turning in my direction. But at that point, an MC stepped out on the stage, and so I stopped worrying about Flabby in favor of the first look at my client. The Saddle Club is proud to present its second show of the evening, featuring the incomparable piano stylist, Edie and Beth, in Dancing Hands. Here they are, ladies and gentlemen. Bring them up. Ah! Curtains parted on a stage set with an oversized full-length mirror which reflected a grand piano, a black vase of yellow flowers, and a tall brunette with a wry, crisp waistline who touched up a piled-high hairdo, put on a pair of long black gloves, checked her hemline, and sat down at the piano. And she ran through an involved arpeggio while her reflection in the mirror looked on in admiration. It was an old but cute routine, and the illusion was perfect because the Tyler twins were practically identical. I took another look at Flabby, whose face was pushed up in a nasty leer. He stood up, dropped a cigarette into his drink, and tossed a crumpled bill down on the table, just as the lights went out for the trick part of the act. On the dark stage, two pairs of purple hands danced over two glowing silver keyboards. It would have been good, except that the pair of hands on the right, which belonged to Beth, suddenly stopped in midair and hit blue notes like a nine-year-old at her first recital. When the lights came up again, my client's face was as white as middle sea. And the flabby character oozing a victorious smile was on his way to the door. Well, they wrapped it up fast after that. And Beth ran into the wings, leaving Edie to take the bow alone. The band took over in a hurry and brought things down to normal. So as couples moved down to the dance floor and George the waiter headed for my table, I sat back and waited for that message from my client. Here you are, sir. Compliments of the house. Oh, Thanks. Any message with this? No, sir. Just that Mr. Redman had to leave. Oh, thanks, George. I sipped the double scotch and wondered if I should take the initiative and contact my client. When the message I'd been waiting for came, good and loud. I jumped up, shoved my way through the gaping dancers to the dressing room hallway behind the stage. A gang of club personnel was bunched in front of a door, obviously locked, labeled Edie and Beth Tyler. Hey, it was one of the twins. Hey, what's the matter? It's one of the twins. She screamed. We got to get in. Uh, that door's locked. Break it down. Uh, but get I, out I, of the I, way. Hey, it's Edie. It's Edie. All right, no, wait, a minute. wait a minute. Hold it. She's all right. Clear out and give her a chance. Come on. Outside, everybody. Beat it. That means you two. Come on. Out. Here, Miss Tyler, take it easy. You're all right now. Come on, sit down. Tell me what happened. I don't know for sure. I was worried about Beth. I came back and didn't see her anywhere. And I heard a noise in here. It was dark. I came in and, and someone grabbed me. A man? Yes. I don't know who it was. Mm-hmm. I screamed. He knocked me down. Then locked the door. 
got out through the window there. Who are you? Oh, I'm Philip Marlowe, a private detective. Your sister hired me to investigate a guy. I was to meet her here after your number and find out about it. Oh. Any idea what's up? No, I can't imagine. But, gee, Beth has been terribly upset ever since last night. Oh? What happened last night? Well, for one thing, my purse was stolen. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't see why that should upset her. Gee, there was nothing in it but $12 and my makeup stuff. Where's Beth now, do you know? No. I haven't seen her since she ran off the stage. I'm not even sure she came in here. No, she was here all right. She dropped one of her gloves. You're still wearing both of yours. Where do you girls live? Maybe she went home. Well, Beth has a cottage out on Hazeltine. 4179. You don't live together? How come? Well, gee, Mr. Marlowe, just working with Beth is hard enough. She's so sarcastic. <laughs> okay, I'll wear my thick skin. Uh, one more thing, Miss Tyler. Do you happen to know where Neil went? Neil's gone? Mm-hmm. Gee, that's funny. He always stays till the place closes. Oh, he must be coming right back. I'll take a look. Then I'm going out to see your sister. Sarcasm at all. I spent ten minutes questioning the help on the whereabouts of the boss and got nothing but double talk for answers. So since I was still carrying Beth's glove around with me, I dropped it in my pocket and went outside to my car. I'd opened the door and slid far enough under the wheels so I couldn't back out before I realized that the dough-faced flab was already there on the seat. His right hand wrapped around something blunt and menacing in his sloppy jacket pocket. You better come on in. What are you doing in my car, blubber boy? Don't get sassy now, mister. And the name is Sippy. That's no improvement and that's no answer. All right. I, uh, saw you inside making with the big talk, so I says to myself... He's an interested party. I should look him up. Maybe we can do business together. All right, stay over there. What kind of business? I'm particular about the gutters I crawl in. It has to do with the twins inside there. You can get in touch with me later for further details. I got an angle, mister. You'll see when I leave. Yeah? When you tried to work that angle, you got to the wrong twin in the dressing room. Do you know that? I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sippy, where can I reach you? You'll find out if you really know what's up. Don't try to follow me, though. I'll be seeing you. When Sippy slid out of the car and beat it, I made one move after him and then stopped cold. Because lying on the seat where he'd been sitting was a green leather handbag with the name Edie etched on it. I snapped it open. It had been stripped of everything but the scent of Amir and the smudged slip of paper that read Number 9 Arrow Motel, Lancashire Boulevard. So that was Sippy's address, and he had the stolen purse. But the why of all the commotion over 12 missing bucks was still the number one question mark. And I figured the best place for an answer to it was at Beth Tyler's. So I drove out to Hazeltine. But even before I stopped at number 4179, I heard the piano. I walked to the door and stood there a moment listening. I eased it open, slipped inside. Soft, indirect lighting accented the figure of a girl at the piano. The little waves of iridescent crimson chased themselves over the smooth, satin gown as she played. Glossy, blue-black hair fell to her shoulders. The side of her burning cigarette sent a single plume of smoke into the still air. Just for a moment, I found it difficult to remember that she was my client. <clears throat> oh? You're, you're looking better, Beth. You're Philip Marlowe, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I dropped by to return your glove, among other things. Just put it there on the table with the other one. Where did you get it, Marlowe? In your dressing room at the club. Your sister tangled with an unidentified man who was hiding there after you left. While we're on that, why'd you shove off so fast? I was scared. How'd you know I'd find you? You're a detective. Remember? Mm hmm Look, if you want to burn up your retainer playing hide-and-seek, it's your business. Now, who's the guy you want me to check on? The flabby one who made you blow up tonight? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Why? Because I think my sweet twin sister is mixed up in something a little more serious than her usual scatterbrain escapades. Mm-hmm. 
And the flabby guy is in on it because he has a green purse, right? How did you know that? He left it with me. Name is Sippy. He lives at the Arrow Motel, number nine. Knows something worthwhile about this business, and he's anxious to sell it. All of which puts him a hop, skip, and a jump ahead of your detective. Now tell me, why is everybody, including Neil Redmond, all wound up over one stolen purse? What's it all about, baby? I don't know. Baby. Suppose you find out and tell me. Wouldn't have anything to do with the fact that Neil loves your sister and you love Neil, would it? Marlowe, I hired you to investigate a man, not to pry into my personal affairs. You'll get more for your money if I stop holding out on me. It's my money. Besides, I'm not holding out. Believe me. I'll try real hard. Well, as soon as I've got something, I'll call you. Where are you going now? Uh, My retainer entitles me to know, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. First to the club to find Redmond and get his side of it, and then... I'll probably drop in on our chum, Sippy, at the Arrow Motel on Lancashire. Good. I'll, uh, keep a light in the window for you. Oh, sweet. <laughs> also keep your door locked. From the inside, baby. As I drove down the dark, winding street toward Ventura Boulevard, I caught a flash in the rearview mirror of a station wagon behind me. It looked like a tail, so I opened up. But it stayed with me. When it swung out into the left lane to pass, it suddenly cut in front of me. I jammed on the brakes as a spotlight slashed at my eyes, and when my front wheel banged against the curb, I was already half out of the car. Stop right where you are, fella. Don't come one inch closer, I'll drop you. I switched off the spotlight, and I saw a face the texture of a doormat over an embroidered purple shirt and orange tie. He had hand-tooled high-heeled boots on and was topped off by a ten-quart cream-colored Stetson. But the doormat face was grim, and the silver-barreled cold pistol in his hand looked right at home. Followed you up here from the saddle club. I don't know what your game is or why you're messing around and what don't concern you, but I aim to find out mighty quick, so start talking. Okay. First, I resent being crowded off the road. Second, I resent a spotlight in my face. And third, I don't like pistols pointed at my stomach. So cool off, Jesse James. You're wasting your time and mine. You got it wrong there, friend. Paul Cedar don't waste his time, and you're going to find that out. Paul Cedar, huh? Yeah. Don't tell me you're all excited over a stolen purse with 12 bucks in it. Twelve dollars. Yeah. Listen, clown, there's thirty grand missing somewhere between Redman and me, and I'm going to get it. Thirty thousand? Yeah. Redman's a high roller, and that's okay with me. But he lost it fair and square in my joint over Nevada, and I've been holding his markers much too long. So if I have to chalk that dough off to experience, it's going to be a pretty unpleasant experience for a certain party. Get me? Yeah, I get you. But you're shoving the wrong way, Longhorn. Somebody's trying to make a fool out of me, bright boy. And I don't stand for that. I'm liable to shove a lot of ways. And hard. So don't get underfoot. Uh, You're sure to get stepped on. So long, dude. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first... Tomorrow marks the anniversary of an important event in American history, the signing of the first peace treaty between the Indians and the Plymouth colonists. In commemoration of these events, CBS's Sunday night stars, Amos and Andy, will be found with a kingfish burying the hatchet deeper than ever in their hopes and dreams. And CBS's own Jack Benny will be back again tomorrow with his special guest, Van Johnson. Invite some friends over. Sit back and enjoy the Jack Benny program. You can hear Amos and Andy every Sunday on most of these same CBS network stations and Jack Benny over them all. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Dancing Hands. When the Texan from Nevada galloped off in his trusty station wagon... I forgot all about Neil Redmond and headed instead for Sippy and his further details at the Arrow Motel on Lancashire, where Bungalow 9 turned out to be an all-alone green and white collection of clapboard that showed light, a half-open door, and nobody home to my knock. When I tried knuckles on wood again and still got only a faint echo for reply, I stepped inside. There in the center of an ivory-white throw rug and clamoring for attention like an only child at a family reunion was a wide and wet circle of red. From there, the ugly splotches that narrowed as they got farther away trailed off until, finally, in the next room, the path ended where I expected it to. The quiet form of Skippy. 
sprawled over an upset chair and holding his hands tight against the red on his left side. When I got to him, he was going fast. Thirty grand. A lot of dough. Didn't know I was shooting that high. And the, the twins... One, one, one what, Sippy? One of them. Did one of them do this? One. one. He's dead, isn't he, Marlo? Yeah. Yeah, Redmond, he's very dead. Oh, no, Marlo. I only found him a few seconds before you did. Yeah, and the rest of that run, you heard someone coming, you didn't want to be seen, so you ducked back out of sight, huh? I don't buy it, Redmond, because for one thing, it's too pat. For another, how do you explain being here in the first place? Come on, fast. Okay, I'm here because I'm on a nasty jam. Like what? Like $30,000 I've got to pay in the next hour to a guy named Paul Cedar who's running out of patience in a hurry, believe me. About that, I do. I've already met the gentleman. But right now, Redmond, we're talking about Sippy. Okay. Last night, I had things to do, so I gave Edie Tyler the money for the payoff to Cedar. A couple of minutes after she stepped out of the club, somebody roughed her up and got away with a purse and the 30 grand. You're a liar, Redmond. Edie herself told me that purse only had 12 bucks in it. How come? Simple like, Marlowe. In my business, you never yell copper too soon or too loud. It doesn't pay. Mm-hmm. Now look, for the third time, Redmond, you and Sippy, how do you figure? I don't know. He was at the club tonight, acting funny. When he left, I got a glimpse of Edie's green purse sticking out of his topcoat pocket. Later on, I saw him run away from the car near the club, so I followed him. I ended up here a couple of minutes behind him, and that Marlowe was a truth, I swear. Would you do at the drop of a... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Look, if you're telling the truth, I begin to get a different picture. And by that, I specifically mean a very talented but very sly dame named Beth Tyler. Oh, no, Marlowe. Why not? Because you love Beth's sister? Face it, Redmond, it doesn't add up any other way. Sippy here couldn't have stolen that purse from Edie. If he did, he'd have taken his dough and blow and not spent his time putting out feelers... But on the other hand, if Sippy happened to see Beth take it from Edie, empty it and toss it away, we've got another story, right? Yeah. Because he wouldn't make a move until he knew how much he had gotten away with. Exactly. But there he ran into trouble because he was trying to get close to Beth. And in doing that, he got mixed up and went for Edie instead, like tonight at the club. Sure. And a dying man's words just now about one twin. To which you can add the unpleasant fact that I personally ran off at the mouth when I was up at Beth's an hour ago. So she knew where to come for Sippy. Look, Redmond, it's got to run that way. I'm sure of it. Well, maybe you're right, Phil, but right or wrong, I'm still in the jam. So if you don't have any objections, I'm going back to my club now for a last try at raising that money again before Cedar shows. You mean you're going to face him, Neil, with or without her? I've got him, Marlo. You see, I own a fast club, all right, and I gamble a lot, too. But I don't welch on my markers no more than I knock over flappy little guys. You know what I mean, Phil? I think so. But don't fold now, Neil, because... I might still be lucky enough to catch up to Beth Tyler and your money both before your time runs out. And right now that means fast to a phone and a call to Edie, who might know which way a runaway twin would head. I'll see you, Neil. The nearest phone was at an all-night mobile gas station a block away. As I dialed Edie's number, a thought hit me. Maybe Beth wouldn't head anywhere. Maybe she'd just stick around. <laughs> Hello? Edie, this is Marlo. Seen anything of Beth? No, I haven't. But why? What is it, Marlo? Well, from where I stand, two things. First, your sister has the $30,000 and $12 that was in your purse last night. Oh? And second, she's just about it for a sloppy around the edges murder. Oh. Now, look, have you any idea where Beth would head if she had to get out of town in a hurry? No, I don't, Marlo. Oh, well, maybe somebody up around her place does. I'll call you later. Marlo, wait. Are are you sold on this? I mean, about the things you said Beth did? Just about, Edie. But for your sake, let's hope I'm wrong. All the way, honey. Goodbye. <laughs> Driving fast back toward Beth's place on Hazeltine still left me enough time to think about a not-too-small detail that I'd completely overlooked. Thanks to me, the entire Los Angeles Police Department knew nothing about what was going on in and around the Saddle Club. Five minutes later, when I'd parked away from the dock and obviously deserted number 4179, and I'd walked back and around to a pair of uncurtained French doors at the side, I knew that oversight is what is generally called a blunder. But in the next second, I knew it was nothing compared to the one I was making currently. If you so much as turn your head again, Marlowe, I'll kill you. 
Not like you did Sippy, please, Beth. I'd hate to go that way. Sippy was a mistake, Marla. Believe me. I was rushed. So you shot and ran, huh? Yes. But I didn't run too far. Because from where I stood, I could hear and see both you and Redmond and talking the whole thing over. And when you knew that we'd caught on to your act, you decided to follow me and see where I was going before you made your next move. Is that it? Exactly. Now get inside. Go on. The door's unlocked. Mm. All right. Now get over there, near that closet, and don't turn around. Why not? Afraid of the look on my face when you shoot? Shut up, Marlowe. And stop being brave. Because unless I have to, I'm not going to kill you. After all, you've already served your purpose. Which I presume was getting mixed up in this mess just long enough to find out about Sippy for you. You presume correctly. Mm -hmm. Also, you talk too much. Now open that closet and get inside. All right. Go on. As you say. But first, baby, one question. Did you do all this for the 30 grand alone? Or does it tie in with Neil Redmond and the way he feels about your sister, Reedy? It's a little bit of each, Marlowe. But as I said, you talk too much. So get in there and shut up. Getting out of Beth Taylor's half-inch thick old closet was like arguing with an umpire. You couldn't be subtle. So 20 tiring minutes went by and the heels on both my feet were numb before the paneling finally gave in and I was out and over to the telephone to put in a call to the police. It should have been made a long time ago. But then, even as I was halfway through dialing the numbers... I saw something on an end table nearby that made me slowly change my mind. It was the two black gloves that Beth wore in the dancing hands act. And while I stared at them like they were alive and beckoning, I thought hard for what must have been a full minute. And then suddenly I knew that my next stop had to be the saddle club. As I parked at the saddle club, I saw light drifting out of Neil's office, which was something I had expected. Inside, I moved along a dark hall toward what I knew would be the trio of Neil Redmond, the Nevada Texan, and Eddie Tyler. All right, Redmond. The raucous voice the of Paul time. Cedar was anything but happy. Just how stupid you think I am? Oh, oh, that's Cedar, I'm telling the truth. Edie had the 30 grand, but somebody got it from her when she was on her way to you. That's a stinking line. You know it, Redmond. You never had the money. This whole thing's been a frame to stall me. And one way or another, I'm going to get you to admit that. No, you're not, Cedar. Uh, and if you don't drop that gun now, you're never going to do anything ever. Come on, let it go. Uh, All right. Now sit down and shut up and listen hard because Redmond's telling you the truth. What? Marlo, you know where the money is? That's right. And I also know who took it. Less than an hour ago, a little after I called you, Edie, Beth caught up to me and confessed the whole shebang, exactly as we figured it, Neil. You mean she admitted getting the money from Edie and using you to locate Sippy? That's right. But there's only one drawback to everything she admitted. None of it's true. What do you mean, Marlo? I mean, Cedar, that Beth Tyler didn't steal your money from Edie here any more than she killed Sippy. I also mean that as far as I can tell, Beth Tyler was nothing more than a girl who played the piano and got upset when a stranger named Sippy started to bother her. And I never saw the real Beth Tyler after she ran away from a piano in the club tonight. That she's dead and that you, Edie, have been posing as Beth all night because, one, you yourself stole Neil's money and, two, you murdered your sister as well. No! Yes, Edie, come on, admit it, it's true. No, no, it isn't. I... I guess it isn't that, Marlo. In Beth's body? In our dressing room. In the closet. I didn't want to kill her. But she found out that I had only pretended to be robbed when there was no one around. That Sippy had seen me scream and get rid of the purse myself. Sippy, who was only trying to muscle in on a deal, went to her by mistake, huh? Yes. That's how she knew what I'd done. When she confronted me in the dressing room, just before you came in and said that she wouldn't stand by and let me do a thing like that to Neil. I lost my temper. You killed her, Edie. Yes, I did, Neil. And when Marlo showed up after her scream, I said that someone had attacked me. And then I pretended to be both Beth and myself from there on to get out of the whole thing. And I... I almost did. But... But now I'm so sorry. A couple of bad hours went by before the police had everybody's story, and Paul Cedar and the 30,000 was gone for Nevada, and Edie was gone for good. 
That left just Neil Redmond and me alone and standing near the main bar in the club. <laughs> Neil was doing his best to stay all in one piece. Well, Marlowe, has been a tough night for you, hasn't it? Yeah, but a tough one for you, Neil. What with Cedar and the money and... The girls, Marlowe? Yeah. Yeah. Lisa came out right before the cowboy got too tough, thanks to you. <laughs> so tell me, Phil, how'd you know that Beth was dead and that Edie was both people all along? That was a couple of gloves, Neil, the ones they wore in their dancing hands act. You see, when I first met Edie in the dressing room, she was wearing hers, and one of Beth's was on the floor. Hey, pour me one, will you? Yes, sir. Okay. I took it, and later when I met what I thought was Beth's, I returned it, and she put it with what we both thought was its mate. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. But a little while ago, when I got close to the gloves again, I saw that that couldn't be, that they were both for the left hand, Neil. Ah. Then when Edie went to Beth's place to pass herself off as her sister, who she had already killed... She was smart enough to know that she should have only one glove around. Yeah, but not smart enough to think about which glove it should be. From there, I worked backwards. Until you got to the three of us at the club and tried what you knew might be the right answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you were right, Phil, all the way. Yeah, but I was still gambling. If I had been wrong, Neil, I was giving the real Beth a long head start. Mm. It's always that way when you gamble, Phil. I know. Sometimes you pick right, sometimes wrong. Mm -hmm. Cards, dice. <laughs> Even with twins. Good night, fella. When I finally got to my car, started out of the valley and back toward Hollywood, it was better than 8 o'clock in the morning. And here and there as I drove, I, I saw people who I'd never heard of and who, well, who'd never heard of me stumbling outside after their morning papers. And I got to wondering what they were going to think when they read about a girl who had killed both her twin sister in a nightclub and a flabby guy in a motel who wasn't much good. Oh, well, it was hard to say. And for myself, I was too tired to think. Or maybe I just didn't want to. <laughs> Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Lou Krugman, Ed Begley, Paul Fries, and Bert Holland. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... When it started, it was simple. Just a lawsuit for damages. But before it was over, it was far from simple, and the damages were murder. All because of a red-headed woman, a ghostwriter with ambition and a match that burned with a bright green flame. <laughs> With part of its star-studded Sunday nights devoted to shows named after great personalities such as Jack Benny, Lum and Abner, and Amos and Andy, CBS also goes to famous fiction for one of the brightest, most dramatic of its Sunday galaxy, The Adventures of Sam Spade. Created by the master hand of Dashiell Hammett, Sam Spade cuts a new and deadly caper with mystery, murder, and adventure on most of these same CBS network stations every Sunday. Join him tomorrow night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.